light my Advent candles as we start to gather our friends together. changed our location just a little bit. I've come into my mm -hmm. dining room. Wanted to have a different view maybe tonight a little bit. I wanted us to be able to share at my table where I love hosting and having friends gather. And so it is tonight on this last night of Advent, and it really is. It is the fourth week. Before we leave tonight, even though it would not be traditional, I will light my Christ candle. I will light the candle that symbolizes the day of, and I know normally we wouldn't do it until Christmas Eve morning, but I wanna share that tonight with you all because I think it's important. We do have the four candles burning tonight as a reminder that this is our fourth week of Advent. We're almost there. Today, I, I thought the weather really had taken us to winter. It was windy and it was cold, at least here. I know I talked to my son in Texas and he's like, Mom, it was 75. I don't know what you're complaining about. I'm like, I'm not complaining. I'm just stating the fact. It was a cold and wintry day and I walked out of church after doing some work over there. And it was kind of fun to see the snow. Um, I don't want the blizzard stuff, but we're getting, I don't know what it's doing except still blowing really hard this evening. But it is good. God is present and he is with you and me. As we begin our studying tonight and our our reflection time, I have a couple of things that are really cool that have happened that I want to share with you tonight. Um, you will want to grab your Bible, though, because we will look at Luke 1. Um, it is the text we looked at Sunday as well, but there's some things that I, I want to point out a little bit more detail about the text itself and, uh, and about what that says for you and me. Uh, today, in this time and in this space that we all are living in. Uh, it is an odd time and space, and I know that for many of us, our, our traditional family gatherings aren't happening. In fact, we may have come to some realities during this season this year that we weren't going to do some things maybe in the future. It's okay. God didn't say we have to do the same thing all the time forever and ever. He really says he is present in all that we do, no matter when and where that is. But he is present with us. How do we make an impact during this season? I hope you've all had some times that you've been able to bless another, that you've been able to serve in a way, I know that um, many of us serve in food pantries or have food boxes that we give out in our, in our communities. And those are amazing places to tell the story of Jesus. It is a time and a space to be able to say, God is here now. He is here in this food and in this time and space. He is present with you and me. So I hope you've had those moments or you've given to a uh, adopt a family or you've done something like that. I hope you have because the joy in doing that is what is in my heart phenomenal. Now I want you to know that starting next week, um, we're gonna continue our Wednesday gatherings and uh, we will go back to Genesis again 
And so we'll pack, pick up where we left off, and I think that was in Genesis 23 or something like that. Um, I'll figure it out before next week. <laughs> and we will pick back up and start Genesis again. Although I think tonight you're going to hear and see some references back into Genesis. And it, it is why I think Genesis is an important book, but why it's important to study and put it in context with old and new together. I think there's a, it's a sense of understanding that totality and of what that means. It is, uh, so I want, I just want you to know that uh, that is the plans for the future. Also, um, tomorrow at two o'clock, um, we will be doing our Christmas service on Facebook Live. The beauty of Facebook Live is if you don't wanna join us at two o'clock, that's fine. It'll be there when you, when you uh, want to share in the fam, hopefully family time of gathering to hear the Christmas story again, to understand how that impact was so incredible. Have you ever sat down at your table and wondered what was underneath it? And I don't have any animals, so I'm not sure what's there, but there's something, the rug is kind of uh, bobbled up there, probably just from chairs moving. But um, yeah, so yeah, again, you know, what we have to remember too is that as we enter Christmas season, you have to remember, we've only been in Advent. We've not gotten to Christmas season yet. Uh, once we enter Christmas season, we have 12 days, 12 days of doing things and being Christmas. Sometimes I think we get through the Christmas and we say, well, okay, it's already by. You know, we get through the 25th and it's like, well, we've already had Christmas. And we haven't had Christmas really yet. We have 12 days, that song is important, the 12 days of Christmas, because it lays out kind of what we are supposed to, how we are to tell the story. So it really is that it just begins uh, for us on Christmas morning. Uh, the story just starts. And yeah, I think sometimes we do wanna wrap it back up and put it all away and God doesn't go away in a box. He just doesn't. And, and I hope that you understand that. And, and I, maybe tonight, um, because our lesson is about the manifestation of the announced mystery, that's a big, those are some big words to have to get around. But I hope we understand our story is just beginning. It is just unfolding for you and me, just the start of it. Um, again, grab your Bibles. We're going to look at Luke 1. I do have, as we even get started, something I'm going to share that I, I found after, after our Hanukkah time. And I have to tell you, uh, Hanukkah this year meant so much more. And it was so different this year than in the past. And I really treasure, uh, treasure that time with you all. And, and learning some things about myself and about a tradition that I am in awe of and the history behind it. And so I want you to know that um, I found something else. In fact, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and kind of get started. I'm gonna start with this. Um, this is a story about a menorah that I'm gonna tell you, read. And it's, it's not a pretty menorah. Uh, here's the picture. It's broken, it's not very pretty. In fact, it looks pretty ugly. And yet, you're going to hear a fantastic story about something ugly that becomes a beauty in the eyes of the one who received it. Like I said, I'm gonna read this story because I can't tell the story any better. A young man named, named Abraham Greenbaum lost his entire family in the Holocaust. After the war, he came to America and wanted nothing to do with Judaism. He changed his name to Aaron Green moved to Alabama, and married a woman there 
who miraculously was Jewish. The day his oldest son, Jeffrey, turned 13, they were not going to celebrate his bar mitzvah. Instead, Aaron decided to recognize the day by taking Jeffrey to the mall and buying him anything he wanted there. When they went to the big electronics store and were browsing, Jeffrey's eye caught something in an antique shop across the way. He was mesmerized. He couldn't take his eyes off of what he had seen. He told his father, I don't want anything from the electronics store. I want to go across to the antique shop. When they got there, the boy pointed to an old menorah, to this one, and said, that's what I want for my bar mitzvah. His father couldn't believe it. He was letting his child purchase anything he wanted in the whole mall. And this is what he was choosing? He tried to talk him out of it, but couldn't. Aaron asked the shop owner the price of the menorah. And to his surprise, the man replied, sorry, it's not for sale. Aaron said, what do you mean? This is a store. He offered a lot of money for it. And again, the owner refused, this time explaining, I found out the history of this menorah. A man constructed it during the war and it took him months to gather the wood. It survived, but he did not. It's going to be a collector's item. It's not for sale. Meanwhile, Jeffrey kept telling his father, that's what I want. All I want is the menorah. So Aaron Green kept offering more money until the owner finally agreed to sell. The boy was so excited. He took the menorah up to his room and played with it every day. One day, the parents heard a crash from Jeffrey's room. They ran upstairs and saw the menorah shattered to pieces. As he paid so much, the father yelled at his son for being so careless as he had paid so much money for it. Afterwards, Aaron felt bad about his reaction. He suggested to his son, let's try to glue it back together. While holding one of the pieces, the father noticed a piece of paper wedged inside. He pulled it out and started reading. Tears welled up in his eyes, and soon after he fainted. His family threw water on him and revived him. What happened, they asked. He replied, let me read you this letter. It was written in Yiddish, so I'll translate. Yiddish is a, a, a form of Hebrew. It's the slang, um, slang more, more slang of Hebrew. To whoever finds this menorah, I want you to know that I constructed it not knowing if I would ever have the opportunity to light it. Who knows if I will live till Hanukkah to see it being kindled. In all probability, going through this war, I will not. But if Providence brings this menorah to your hands, you who are reading this letter promise me you will light it for me and for us, for my family and for those who gave their lives to serve God Almighty. Aaron Green then looked up at his family and in a choked up voice with tears still in his eyes said, the letter is signed by my father. They were all speechless. That family recognized the divine providence involved. How could they not? The hand of God had, was undeniably undeniable, taking a menorah from Europe and bringing it back to the family in a remote mall in Alabama, inspiring their spiritual journey. I still get choked up when I think about the story of that young boy, that bar mitzvah, mm -hmm. 
was one unlike any other, I'm sure. It had to have been. That menorah that was handmade by a great grandfather or grandfather was now returned to his family. A family that had maybe lost sight of their faith, had lost sight of who this God was, but was now found in the midst. I had to share that with you all. After our eight days of Hanukkah, it only seems appropriate. And now we begin our study in Luke 1. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her, who, said, who was said to be barren. But nothing will it be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with you according to your will. Then the angel departed from her. See, Advent is about love. Francis Bacon once wrote, A crowd is not company. Faces are but a gallery of pictures, and talk is but a tinkling symbol where, when there is no love. We are social beings. That is our blessing and our curse. We long for each other, we long to touch, to share, to bear some part of ourselves, with, to be understood, to invite others into our lives. We all long to lessen the loneliness that lurks in the background of even our most crowded moments. We are born alone. Well, not really. <laughs> and we will ultimately die alone. Maybe. But in between, we desperately want to be known, to be understood, to belong, to find some kind of acceptance just as we are. Some intimacy of soul. And so we reach out with fragile, delicate efforts of love. But love is dangerous. We can hurt each other. Hearts can be broken. Rejection can come. If you try to belong, you can be excluded, and that can hurt more than being alone. Love and the vulnerability that comes with it can be the riskiest business of all. But there is no love without such risks. Like hunger and thirst, the longing for love is implanted deeply within us, and God offers us many opportunities to care, to reach out, and to love and to love. Love is always a risk, but it is a risk upon which the very heart of life depends. To love is to touch the heart of God, to look into the eyes of another and recognize our common soul is to face, to see the face of God. 
even to feel the ache of a heart broken, for love is to discover God's grace. Let's pray. Your love, O oh God, is great, and the risks you have taken were supreme. From the depths of your creating love, you made us male and female. In the goodness of your covenant, you created us a community of your love. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, a man of love that risked all for the sake of the world, to teach us the way of love and help us to walk in it. Teach us the way, God, of love and help us to walk in it. Help us, O oh God, to reveal your love as we discover anew the tremendous power of the Christmas story and meet again the Christ child born anew among us. Amen and amen. Exactly. See, the fourth candle is the candle of love that we light. So we've had hope, joy, peace, and now love. All those tenets around which really the Christmas story and even our reading on in Luke about Mary is so important. See, what I want you to remember, and maybe, and it, it, it's what kind of the takeaways that my Sunday sermon was about, being favored, and you and I have been chosen. You and I are favored in God's eyes. We are the ones, as Mary was, to meet this God face to face. We are to be obedient, to do as God calls us. And sometimes we say, but I really don't want to maybe do that. I don't know, God. I think that's a little crazy. Oh, man, God, you're pushing me out of my comfort zone. Oh, man, you mean you want me to, you want me to, like, tell a story to other people? Oh man, God, really? You mean I need to share? But it's also about hope. Hope for our humankind because God entered into this sinful world to be with you and me. He came to be part of the story. I want you to think about those three words favored, obedient, hope. How do they fit into the whole Christmas story, into our Advent story? How does it all fit? How does it fit when we are called to go witness or to share? With someone who has less or who doesn't live in maybe as clean a house as what you and I maybe live in. For someone who has little to nothing. It's scary. I will it will share that one with you. There's times I've walked up to doors not sure what's on the other side and how I'm going to be received. Sometimes I walk up to a house and I that I've been asked to come to for a reason and not sure what I'm going to find. Sometimes those houses are very smelly, very chaotic, very not what I'd want. And yet God has me there for a reason. It's okay. God has you and me where he needs us for a reason now. As I was thinking about this, this lesson and this reading, and to unpack it a little bit more, what I think is we cannot limit the freedom of God. We need to remember he is free to do as he wills with you and me. And he will, unless we say no, no, I don't want to. I'm going to put the barriers up. 
and I'm going to turn my back and I'm going to say, no, my eyes are closed and I don't see this God. No, go away. Well, we can do that. Oh, sure. We have that choice. We have that free will. You know, even temples, magnificent temples and places of worship don't confine God. He remains free to manifest himself and to be present wherever he chooses. Even outside what we consider sacred spaces. He finds us in the places we maybe don't want to be found. He finds us and leads us to the places that we don't maybe want to go. But it is because of our story and it is because of Jesus that our salvation is assured. But see, that salvation rests on a covenant, on the presence of God at the heart of history and at the heart of our history. God has to be present for you and me. See, as I was studying this, I kind of looked at Psalm 89, and you can go back and look at Psalm 89. Let me read it to you, parts of it. Forever I will sing the goodness of the Lord. The favors of the Lord I will sing forever. Through all generations my mouth shall proclaim your faithfulness. For you have said my kindness is established forever. In heaven you have confirmed your faithfulness. I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, forever will I confirm your posterity and establish your throne for all generations. He shall say of me, you are my father, my God, my, the rock, my savior. Forever I will maintain my kindness towards him and my covenant with him stands firm. See, in the person that... In, and in the word that God, bleh, bleh, in the person of the word made flesh conceived by Mary, and in the born of David's lineage, the oracle pronounced has seen its fulfillment. It is to the child born in Bethlehem that the father had sworn love and faithfulness forever. What'd you think the other night? On Monday night, the star of Bethlehem, the interlooping of the two planets that came together for Saturn and Jupiter. For me, it was kind of cool. And some of you have seen my pictures of, it happened to be two uh, plain contrails, but happened to form a cross just below, just below the star. Oh, and it got brighter through the night. It was amazing to watch, to see that star and to see the cross as well. From cradle to grave, that salvation history has been written for you and me. And it has been written in those words of being favored and obedient and in hope, God has written those words for you and me. And we are to rejoice. We are to rejoice as Mary did. Not be afraid. To, we do need to be full of grace just like Mary was. See, she may have wondered, but the angel said, do not fear. Now remember, in Genesis, we, we looked up how many times do not fear shows up in the Bible. 365, one for every day. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. Do not be afraid of what God is going to do for you because he has said enough times for you and me each day to hear that story. Because the Lord is with you. He, the angel says to Mary, but he says it to you and me as well. The Lord is with you. Do not be afraid. I am here. I'm with you every day. See, I put it in the Bible that many times. You can count on it. Jesus actually means God saves in Hebrew, out of Hebrew. Son of the Most High, Son of God, it is not 
a question on who this God is. He saves his people. Salvation is there and present for you and me in the, in the story to Mary, in the promise to what Mary hears. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, the angel says. That's also said in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. It is in the Old Testament as well. You know, what I think is kind of cool is that in a way, in a way, I think it is as as God is cloaking Mary and getting her ready, think about a mother bird. A mother bird, after babies have hatched, she's still got to watch them, though, and keep them close. And so she kind of herds them in and gets them and sits on them. Well, maybe not sit. Well, I think they kind of do. Gets them underneath them. And they are protected. They are they are shadowed with wings. They are cared for and nestled in. And I, I feel like that's what Mary was. She was being overshadowed with the wings of God. And isn't that an awesome image that we also can take on? We are the favored ones as well. We are carrying the story of grace and love and mercy. We are also covered in our baptism we are covered, you know, think about this. Think about that in Genesis, okay, again, we go back to that. The waters, the breath of God and the spirit moved over the waters and everything was covered with water and God then blew it apart and said, no, I'm going to take, give life. See, it becomes important for us to remember those stories of old as well. It's about a relationship. It's about a relationship with God. It's about a relationship with each other. That how do we build that relationship? How do we sit and talk with another? I have to share. The other day, I, I made a visit in Kansas City and with a friend with a friend who we discovered her roots are here at Salem, but she ended up with her family being in Kansas City, but her, her familial roots are back here. And as we started talking, one, it came to my attention that um, she had all her life attended the church that I was baptized in. that I attended many, many Christmas services at, attended many, many Sunday services because we went to church with Grandma and Grandpa a lot. She knew all the people I knew. She knew my cousins. She knew my family. And I already knew that we had gone to school to the same grade schools and junior highs and that kind of thing. She's younger than I am. But her brothers were in the same class. Her brother was in the same class with my brother. The connections became so entwined and intertwined that it was phenomenal to sit and build a relationship and grow a new sister. A woman of faith who I admire and who now I feel so close to because our family stories are interlocking stories. That's the relationship we are to have with each other. Now, we may not have known each other for all the years that I've known her, or her family anyway. But we are to be relational and know each other intimately. And yet we're afraid sometimes in our culture today to sometimes do that. I love the last words of our reading because 
For God, nothing is, poss is impossible. It is about... It is about remembering the grace of God. Remembering his power and his majesty. Remembering that we have to build community. Maybe it is about a revival. And I've talked about that before. I still think that it is happening. I think there is a movement on in our culture for many of us to say, we have to have revival. We have to move forward. We have to tell this story. We have to build. If I am truly favored and I am obedient, I am hope filled that I will be the one to share it and move it forward. Let me read one more reading. Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. The breath of God has filled your life. In you, the Most High takes on human form. Virgin Mary, God makes you his dwelling place. Blessed be the Lord, the great King. His house will be rebuilt forever. Virgin Mary, God makes you his dwelling place. The Lord fills the heavens and the earth. What house can be built for him? Virgin Mary, God makes you his dwelling place. The Lord is our God and we his people. He is coming to dwell among us. Virgin Mary, God makes you his dwelling place. Is God welcome? Is God welcome to come into your heart and into your house? Will he come? Is he with you? I know he is, friends. I also know sometimes it's difficult in the world we live in to stay hope-filled. It's even hard to stay obedient. But remember one thing. In being a Christian, it means of Christ, anointed by him with the grace of God. It's a name full of promises for you and me to be Christian. But maybe more so, there's a huge responsibility that goes with that title. My dear friends, we are called to share, to be. It is on this eve of Christmas Eve. We're going to light the my Christmas candle. We're lighting it because we know the hope and the promise of yet to come. Tomorrow afternoon or tomorrow evening, when you when you can share in this joy come come and be like i said two o'clock we gather for worship oh i have a candle that went out but at two o'clock we celebrate and remember well this jesus who came to light the world to live eternally, and salvation is ours. On this night, sweet prayers to each of you. I hope you have safety in these days ahead. But come and visit me tomorrow at 2, Sunday at 10. Um, we'll be having a hymn sing during church time. So if you want to sing all your favorite Christmas carols, come and join us then. My friends, have an amazing evening. God loves you and so do I. Have a great evening.